Oh, whoops. Oh, am I supposed to be doing a video lecture right now? Shoot. I'm sorry, guys. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, back to the video lecture. Um, this is going to be video lecture number 18, I think. And uh, it's on uh, kind of a case study of evolution. So, it's going to be about bacteria and how they can be resistant to an antibiotics, uh, which is a kind of medic medicine we use to treat them. So, to start off with, here's a little uh, cartoon, a little joke, where you have one bacteria, which we see right here, and he's trying to give a gene to another bacteria that contains a resistance to an uh, antibiotic called penicillin. Let me get the pen going here. And um, so what you have is when one bacteria sort of transfers the gene to another bacteria, it's called horizontal gene transfer, and it's kind of unique to bacteria. They can actually swap genes with each other, um, unlike humans, which, you know, the only way we can pass our genes on is through reproducing and, and having offspring. But bacteria can actually just swap genes between each other, which allows them actually to evolve faster um, and share information. Uh, so we're going to kind of walk through this case study of uh, an antibiotic resistance, and we're going to start off with just sort of a background view of, our, of bacteria. So just remembering a few things here. Remember that bacteria are prokaryotes, which means that they're only single-celled, and they're relatively small. They're definitely going to be smaller than the cells that you know humans are made of or other uh, animals are. And you know their shape can vary. And if you see here, we have some rod shapes, some spheres. There's some even corkscrew or spiral-shaped bacteria. So they come in different um, shapes. They only can reproduce asexually. Right? So that means that they're not doing meiosis. Uh, they're only just basically copying themselves through mitosis. So there's no uh, shuffling of genes. The only way that they can create new genes or new versions or new alleles is through uh, mutations, um, which uh, can happen quite often actually in bacteria because they reproduce so fast. And then, like I mentioned earlier, they also do something called horizontal gene transfer, which is a, 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 a way that two bacteria can swap information and swap genes with each other. Uh, some roles of bacteria, just to re-familiarize yourself with some of the things that bacteria do. Number one is decomposition. This is a huge, huge, huge role that bacteria play. Everything that dies, right, whether it's trees, other kinds of plants, uh, animals, other bacteria, fungus, whatever it is, whatever life dies, it has to be decomposed or it would just pile up and up and up and up. And we would just, you know, it wouldn't be sustainable. So bacteria, you know, along with fungus, uh, can help decompose things. And that's a huge role that they play. Really, really important. Uh, another really important thing to do is they fix nitrogen. Um, we didn't really talk about this too much in ecology, but plants need nitrogen uh, to make things like amino acids and other, and other biomolecules. And they actually can't extract the nitrogen from the air or the soil themselves. But bacteria can and will help convert that nitrogen into a form that a plant can use and the plant will form a, a symbiotic relationship with bacteria where the bacteria gives the plant the nitrogen and the nitrogen or rather the plant um, oftentimes gives the bacteria glucose right like sugar or food uh, as far as humans and bacteria and, and the relationship we have with bacteria we have actually a very very close and intimate relationship with bacteria that you might not have known um, and that goes beyond just some of the things you might think of with food products. So yes, of course, we use bacteria for making yogurt and cheese, which is why, um, you know, it's really useful for, for um, you know, industry making food as well as industry like wastewater treatment, right? We use bacteria to actually clean water. Um, and in biotechnology, we use, um, you know, bacteria to produce things for ourselves, like one of, one of the classic example is we actually have genetically modified some bacteria to produce insulin, which we can use to give to people who have things like type 2 uh, or type 1 diabetes, <clears throat> where they don't produce their own insulin. So it's kind of like a medicine that the bacteria are making that we can give to people to help them out. Um, the, the really kind of intimate relationship that we have with bacteria is what we call our microbiome, or sometimes called our, our, um, our gut flora. Um, and you may not have known this, but really what's going on inside of your body is pretty crazy, especially in your, you know, your stomach, your intestines. 
you have bacteria that just lines the inside of your body and they help us with digestion, they help us with our immune system, um, and without them we wouldn't really be at nearly as healthy um, or survive the way we do. So they're really, really important. In fact, we have so many bacteria in and on our skin uh, you know, and in our intestines and things like that, that it's actually a one-to-one -one ratio. For every cell of your own, there's a bacteria cell. So you're actually 50% yourself and 50% bacteria, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, but of course, bacteria cause disease as well. There's also, there's also harmful bacteria that we want to prevent ourselves from being exposed to because they can damage our cells and they can release toxins that make us sick or even kill us. So um, how do we control these harmful bacteria? Well, most of the time what we do is we just clean things, right, with disinfectants, like chemicals. Um, so alcohol and bleach are chemicals. They're not really medicine. They're very general. They don't specifically attack bacteria. So alcohol and bleach will actually kill pretty much any living thing, right? If you submerge, submerge any organism in bleach or alcohol, they're going to die, right? Even a human would. It's just, they're just toxic chemicals to any living thing. So they're not specific for bacteria. Um, heat and cold are not specific really either. Most organisms can only survive in a certain temperature range. So oftentimes what's really important is refrigeration, right? If we freeze or, or cool our food, it doesn't, get, uh, doesn't grow bacteria as fast because bacteria grow slow when it's cold. Or if we cook our food, right, heat it up really high, we can kill the bacteria on it and that helps keep it safe for us to eat. Before we had refrigeration, um, you know, well, how did people keep their food from going bad? Well, they preserved it with things like salt, sugar, or vinegar. So basically, you just like, let's for, say, for example, you go out and you kill an elk, and you've got this just giant elk with tons of meat on it. That meat's going to go bad really quick unless you can find a way to preserve it because the bacteria is going to start growing on it, and then it goes bad. So what they would do is they would take these big hunks of meat, and they would just you know, uh, submerge it in salt solutions, and it became so salty that the bacteria couldn't grow in the salt around the outside of it. And so then you could preserve the meat that way. And so that's the way we used to do it. Um, more specific things for treating uh, bacteria, things like vaccinations, which would basically be an injection or something you would get that would stop you from being able to be infected by the bacteria. And vaccinations work basically by teaching your immune system what the bacteria looks like so when you get infected with it, it already knows, ah, I've seen that before, and it can attack and, and hopefully kill the bacteria before it has any chance to hurt you. So a vaccination is more like training your immune system. Uh, an antibiotic, which is what we're going to talk about today, is a medicine that is produced to kill, to specifically kill bacteria. It wouldn't kill anything else. An antibiotic is not going to kill any other animal, any other plant, right? It's not going to kill viruses. It only kills bacteria by targeting them in a very specific way and disabling parts of their uh, makeup. Um, so um, let's talk about antibiotics. So what are they? Well, antibiotics, it turns out, are naturally occurring. They're, we don't make them. Like we're not sitting in a lab making antibiotics yet. We might be able to in the future, but right now most of, the bact most of our antibiotics are acquired from natural sources, and they're produced usually by things like mold and fungus to fight off bacteria from infecting the mold or fungus. So it's the fungus' way of defending themselves against bacteria and competing with bacteria. And, um, you know, in the late 1800s, we, uh, some scientists started to see that bacteria were being inhibited near mold colonies. So if you look in this image here, this is a penicillin colony. And pen penicillin is a type of fungus or a type of mold. And notice that, and this, this is bacteria, these stripes here, this is all bacteria. Notice that there's a ring right there where bacteria is not growing. That's called a zone of inhibition, and that's because the penicillin bacteria is producing an antibiotic that kills the bacteria, so bacteria cannot get close to it. So scientists noticed this, and they said, oh, wow, this, there's something going on here where this, this mold is preventing the growth of bacteria around that. Hmm, I wonder if we can use that for our benefit. Turns out we can. So, you know, starting in the mid to early 1900s, scientists figured out how to extract the chemicals that were produced and create medicine out of them. And now, and from that point forward, we had things like penicillin and then after that other antibiotics that we used to help treat a lot of our bacterial infections that would kill millions of people. So this is a huge revolution in, in medicine. 
you know, before antibiotics, people were dying all the time from infections that we, you, we get today and we don't even think twice about them. We just go, oh, that's fine. We'll just take an antibiotic and we'll be good. However, you know, before the early 1900s, people would be dying of this. It was really, really serious. So I can't overstate how important antibiotics were when they were discovered and how important they still are and why this resistance that bacteria is getting to antibiotics is becoming a huge problem. And so I want to talk about that now, actually, like what's going on with the resistance? How come our antibiotics are becoming less and less effective over time? Um, and we're noticing that a lot of bacteria are becoming resistant to them and no longer uh, are affected by them. So we're just going to go through this like we did with most case studies. We're going to look at it through the lens of VIST. Um, and remember, for evolution to happen, VIST has to be satisfied. So every part of VIST has to be true. So let's start with variation. So if we want to sort of describe how bacteria are evolving, and becoming more resistant to antibiotics, we got to start with the variation in the population. So if you look at a population of like wild bacteria, let's say, um, and we take a look at the all of the individual bacteria in that population, we're already going to see variation. They're not all going to be exactly the same. Even though they reproduce asexually, they create there's mutations that occur to make them a little bit different from each other. And it turns out that about 20% of a, of a wild type bacteria will already have some mutations that will make them resistance to some antibiotics. So there's already some individuals in the population that are resistant to the antibiotics. Not very many, but some. Okay. And remember that with uh, bacteria, mutations arise frequently because they reproduce so fast, right? They divide within 24 hours or a whole new population can, can arise. Um, and so what we see is that there's variation already in the population. Some bacteria are more resistant than others. So there is variation. So it's satisfied. Right? If there's no variation in a population, evolution can't happen. Uh, inheritance. Remember the, that variation, those genes that give some organisms a, a better chance of survival have to be able to be passed down to future generations. And of course, bacteria do reproduce. It's asexual, but they do create new individuals and they pass those genes on. Um, and bacteria also have that cool sort of um, thing called horizontal gene transfer that they can do as well, which means that if a bacteria has a mutation that gives it some resistance, it could actually pass that to another bacteria in the same generation. So yes, those genes that help those uh, bacteria be resistant to the antibiotics can be inherited and passed on to other bacteria. Now the S part, the selection. So what is the selection pressure that's pushing the bacteria to become more and more resistant? Well, it's the antibiotics themselves. So the antibiotics themselves are a selection pressure on the bacteria. Because what do they do? The antibiotics are killing the least resistant bacteria, right? So the ones that are the most susceptible to the antibiotics will die really quickly. Can't snap. Really fast. The ones that have some stronger resistance will survive a little bit longer, right? So the idea is that the selection is selecting for the bacteria that are more resistant and killing the bacteria that are less resistant. So the population shifts towards more resistance as the less resistant ones start to be die, start to die, right? So again, selection for bacteria that have more resistance. So these are bacteria that could survive in the presence of a higher amount of antibiotics or could just survive longer in the presence of antibiotics. They're the ones that will be passing on their genes more often than the ones that die quickly. So what kind of selection pressure is this? Can we remember? Think about it. If you can't remember, look back at your notes. I'm not going to give you the answer. Remember, there's directional, divergent, and stabilizing, or disruptive and stabilizing. Which are the three? Insufficient dosage leaves survivors. So if the antibiotic is administered and kills some of the bacteria, then the antibiotic is removed. What's left behind? The strongest. And they reproduce and create more strong bacteria. And over time, they get stronger and stronger and stronger. So it's really important to know that selection is the antibiotic. So the selection is the antibiotics themselves. Um, so <clears throat> the idea would be that if you could take your antibiotics and expose all the bacteria to the antibiotics at the right dosage and for the right amount of time, you should technically be able to kill all the bacteria and then they shouldn't be able to evolve. Right? But we know, of course, that's not the case. Um, it's not always going to be 100% killed 
because we don't always do the proper dosage and we don't always do it for the right amount of time. We always, we, it's always possible to leave behind the strongest survivors. Um, and then the last part of this, remember, is time. So how much time is needed here? Not as much as you would think because bacteria reproduce so fast, right? And we know that as time goes by, the more resistant bacteria survive and make the population in each generation more and more resistant. Um, and I just wanted to point out and make a note of it that the, re the, the, the generation times for bacteria is really short. Some bacteria can reproduce in as little as 15 minutes. Right? So, so we're talking very, very fast. So bacteria evolve extremely quickly compared to things like humans where our generation times can be 20 years to 30 to 40 years long. So I want to give you some examples of some resistance that have been occurring. The most it's kind of scary one that's happening re that's been happening for a while now actually is Staphylococcus aureus um, and staph or if you've heard of staph infections this is what we're talking about so this is a type of bacteria um, that lives on the skin and in mucous membranes so like the membranes that line our nose or our digestive system um, it'll sort of like to it likes to thrive in those those areas and it will also get into open wounds so if you get a cut you can get staph in there if you get infected. Its generation time is 30 minutes, so it divides really, really quick. So it evolves fast. Um, and so I want to show you the resistance timeline of this bacteria. So this bacteria um, uh, was a real killer. It was killing a lot of people. And in 1943 was when penicillin was first put on the market and being used as a medicine. Turns out it did not take very long for staph to become resistant. 1947, it was no longer uh, penicillin. Penicillin no longer worked on staph. So what is that? Four years. It worked four years. Then we uh, found another one. We found another antibiotic called methicillin in 1959. Staph resistant by 1961. Right? It became there was two other ones. There was tetracycline and erythromycin, which are under two antibiotics um, that it became resistant to as well. I don't know the timeline for that. Vancomycin was another one. I don't know when it was um, first marketed, but I do know that as of 2002, staph is resistant to it. Um, There's a whole family of antibiotics dis discovered called oxozolidinones. Ox Those were uh, resistant in 2003. And now what we call it is MRSA. If you ever heard of MRSA, what MRSA stands for is methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or sometimes called multiple resistant. Um, but it's a strain of staph bacteria that are really, really resistant to a lot of antibiotics. And you see here a, a kind of a picture of what that staph infection looks like when it's just beginning, right? That's a staph infection here. Here's the first there's a little wound right here. And then this is what it looks like after a few days um, turns out most often acquired in hospitals. I want you to think about that. Why is it that most people who get staph infections or rather MRSA get it from a hospital? Think about what's going on. Think about selection pressures and hospitals. Why is a hospital the most likely place for staph to evolve resistance? Think about selection pressures. Sometimes it's called flesh eating bacteria. Um, and it infects open wounds and causes uh, tissue death at that area. Uh, and eventually, if it gets bad enough, it can lead to open wounds, you know, exposing internal organs, some like really nasty stuff. Um, and it's so resistant to antibiotics that it can be untreatable. So it has a 20 to 50% mortality rate. That means 20 to 50% of people who contract MRSA die of it because it's resistant to the antibiotics. So we give them these antibiotics and it doesn't work because the bacteria is resistant. So they've evolved resistance. Uh, MRSA kills about 20,000 people per year. That's a lot of people. This was in the news a while back, maybe like 10 years ago or so. Um, this college football player got a uh, MRSA infection and he had to have his leg amputated <clears throat> because of how bad the infection was. The antibiotics just weren't working and the MRSA was slowly creeping up his leg and they realized, you know what, the only way to do this is to just lop it off. And uh, that's what ended up happening. So the guy lost his leg because of this MRSA infection. So it's pretty bad. You don't wanna get MRSA. If you think you have MRSA, you wanna go to the doctor as soon as possible. Turns out MRSA, although it's one of the most 
famous uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria. There are others. Gonorrhea, which is an STD or an STI, is um, becoming resistant. It's a bacteria that is sexually transmitted uh, and it's becoming resistant. So gonorrhea is now, we used to have, gonorrhea used to be an STI that you would get and you could just take antibiotics and you'd be fine. But now there are strains of it appearing that are resistant. So it becomes more serious. There's also a, there's a, something called streptococcus pneumonia, which causes pneumonia. And um, it's becoming resistant as well, which is scary. Pneumonia used to be a real big problem. Then antibiotics helped it. Now it's coming back. And then there's also tuberculosis or TB is becoming another issue as far as resistance. So all these bacteria that caused really, really deadly diseases in the past that we thought we had treated are fighting back kind of. They've evolved resistance. Um, so it's kind of like this war between humans and bacteria right now, and the bacteria are coming back on us. So we got to be careful here. So to end this, and I, uh, and I want to just sort of emphasize this, the re there's a reason, there's a way around this. We don't have to just relinquish control and, and we don't have to like just say, oh, the bacteria is going to become resistant and we're, there's nothing we can do. It turns out there is things we can do. One of the problems is that we overuse and misuse antibiotics and we actually help the bacteria become resistant by doing this. So one of the big things is that we take antibiotics and we put it in the food for um, livestock like chicken, cattle, pigs. Um, and in fact, 80% of all the antibiotics used in the U.S. are used to feed livestock in low doses. It helps accelerate the growth of the livestock and helps them survive in these overcrowded and unsanitary conditions. Um, however, the problem is that we use them at such low doses that it, what it's really doing is it's killing the weakest bacteria and selecting for the strongest bacteria. And so the bacteria are evolving resistance that way, right? So not a good thing. Another thing is there's a lot of antibiotic uh, products that are marketed as this will kill 99.99% of bacteria because it has antibiotics in it, which seems like a good thing, but it turns out that it's not. You don't want to use antibiotics just to wash your hands or just to clean the surface of a table because what you're doing is you're selecting for the strongest bacteria every time you do that. So there's no point in using antibiotics in cleaning supplies. Right. We're realizing that more now and you don't see it as often, but it, it was a problem. Um, we'll just skip that real quick in, in lieu of time. And then the misuse, you know, people were taking antibiotics for things they shouldn't have. So if someone has a cold or a flu, which is caused by a virus, antibiotics do not work on viruses. So they would go to the doctor and be like, oh, I don't feel really well. I have a cold. Oh, boo -hoo. Can I have an antibiotic? I heard it does all the cures. And the doctors would give in because the patients really, really wanted something. They would say, I need something to help me. The doctors would say, fine, take antibiotics, whatever. And what are you doing there? You're not, you're just exposing bacteria to the antibiotics more so they can evolve faster. So it's really important that doctors do not give antibiotics to um, anyone with a virus infection, only for serious bacteria infections should antibiotics be used. And then people would take their antibiotics and they wouldn't use them correctly. They would take, you know, the pills for a couple days and they'd feel better and they'd just throw the rest of the pills away. And they would say, okay, well, I don't need them anymore. But what that does is you just, again, you just killed off this, the weakest ones and left the strongest ones behind, which is selecting and pushing the evolution of bacteria towards more resistance, right? So it's really important that if you're given and prescribed antibiotics by a doctor, that you take the full dose all the way through to the last pill. Right? There's a reason why they tell you to do that, because what you want to do is wipe out every single bacteria and leave no survivors. You want complete annihilation of the bacteria in your body. You are doing bacterial genocide with those antibiotics. Okay, You're not just sort of going, well, I'll take some and then when I feel better, I'll stop. No, no. you got to show no mercy. There's no mercy here. Um, and... <clears throat> The problem is that this is causing, you know, more and more resistance, which is costing society more and more money. Um, but the, and that's and the problem is not necessarily the money; it's the lives. People are starting to suffer more. Bacteria is becoming more and more of a problem. So how do we prevent this? To wrap this up, how do we prevent this? Well, first of all, we got to make sure that we don't buy uh, meat that is indoctrinated with antibiotics. So you're looking for meat that has organic or labels on it that tell you it's not fed an, uh, antibiotics. So try and do that. Another thing you can do is only take antibiotics when necessary. So if you have a cold or flu, you don't need them. And then if you are prescribed them, take the full dose, 100%. Remember, no mercy. 
Um, avoid the use of antibacterial products like triclosan. So always look at a soap or a cleaning thing. And if on the back it says triclosan, it means it has an antibiotic. You do not want to buy those. All you need is soap and water, really. That's actually really, really effective at cleaning things. You don't need any more than that. So what does the CDC recommend? By the way, CDC is the Center for Disease Control. What do they recommend? They recommend just washing your hands with warm water and soap, and that's the best way to reduce the amount of microbes or germs or bacteria on your hands. You don't need these crazy cleaning supplies. Um, if soap and water is not available, use an alcohol-based sanitizer, right? You want it to be at least 60% alcohol. And remember, alcohol is a general killer, so it's, it's, very, it's nearly impossible for something to become resistant to alcohol um, because it just kills all life forms in general. It's not specific. Um, so the best thing, like they say, so your hand sanitizers do not eliminate, eliminate all types of germs. Um, so they're not as effective, especially when your hands are dirty or greasy. So if you have greasy hands and use a hand sanitizer, it's, it's not that effective. So again, the best thing is to simply wash your hands. Do you guys remember how to wash your hands? If you don't, here's some step-by-step -step instructions. You wet your hands under the water. You put some soap on, you do this for maybe 20 seconds, then you rinse it off, and you dry your hands, and then you turn the top off. <laughs> so that's how you wash your hands, and that's all you really need. Um, I think that's the end. Yeah, that's the end of it. All right. I have no idea how long that was. It's probably way too long, so I'll end it there. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. And I got to...